we could never thank you all enough for the kindness that you've extended to us during our time of being ill. And other people in the congregation could say the very same thing. Food has been brought, not just once, but many times. And there's one particular family that whenever they send food, they also send some little flowers, almost always buds. And the buds are very carefully wrapped in tinfoil with some ice to preserve them. And so when we take the food, we put the little buds in a bud vase and put it on the table. And there they wait. Lent is a time of waiting. And as a matter of fact, many of the times of the Christian year are times of waiting. We wait for the brown to become green. I walked out and looked at the yard the other day, and there's this brown all over the place. And here and there are those little shoots of green. And I think of Fred Craddock's story I've shared with you many times when he said that preaching is throwing light bulbs on concrete to a little shoot of green makes its way up toward the sun of the morning. And I thought God is doing that in a major way. The dogwood tree, which looked like it was not going to ever visit us again with life, is beginning to look like it's ready. There's a bush just outside the door of the house that if you take a look at it, you'll say that poor bush hadn't got a chance in the world. There's no way it's not going to make it. And yet as I passed by, I broke off a little brown end and saw the slightest presence of green. Are you in a brown place in life? Are you in a place where things hurt badly? Where disappointments and brokenness and woundedness is a part of your picture. You see, that's the story of Lent, that ours is a God who is not exempt from those things either. Ours is a God who knows exactly what all of that feels like. It's cross days, bear the cross days, where sometimes the injustices of the world come toward us, where sometimes the unexpected and really undeserved wounds of life are brought to us and we feel inflicted. Isn't it interesting to read the scriptures about a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, about one who takes upon himself the burden and weight of our particular transgressions. And so from time to time we live in the world where the old stuff seems to have its way. So many times it's that pain of the past or that failure of the past or that difficulty of the past that seems to keep on coming back to haunt us. And we can hear Paul speak to us, forgetting those things which are behind, I press on. But sometimes it seems to be his story and not ours because we are still caught in the brown and have not yet begun to move toward the wonder and possibility of the green. I think a lot of times we look at the past, too. I remember going to some churches, and they would ask, what are some things that you would suggest that we could do that would help our church to really move and to make our church really very much alive? And you make some suggestions, and they say, but we've never done that before. You know, and you probably run into people who will say, um, that's not the way we do it. And uh, the willingness to be open to new possibilities the willingness to make oneself available to the fact that there can be change is true, truly what faith is all about. Behold, I do a new thing. That's the gist of the scripture today. It springs forth. I begin to do it now. I want to do some brand new things. Let me tell you one new thing that would be very good for you, for you to have your personal moment filled with the presence of the living God. You probably have it already, or maybe you've had it before, or maybe you can call it back by memory, or maybe you can just sort of take a deep breath, and there will be the divine presence, because God is certainly present wherever we are. But there are people, and there are circumstances, and there are moments that make that very real for us. I thought he might be here today, but not long ago. I don't see James. James is not here. Is he the James Bailey? That James. Um, James Bailey, one of the guys that came to us from Monday morning, coming down to this altar to profess his faith in Christ and to want to begin to lead, to lead a brand new life, literally covering this altar with his tears and with our tears. That's a moment where resurrection appears in the midst of difficulty. 
That's a moment where something new appears along the pathway of a whole lot of old stuff that could get us down or that could overcome us. I love the fact that it says, it's right there on the front of the bulletin, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now, I'm not trying to be cutesy-poo or anything else, but how many of you, don't hold your hands up, sometimes feel like you're right stuck in the middle of the wilderness and that the desert is so hot and so threatening and so deadly that there's no way to get out of it. There is a voice that speaks to us that says, I am the one who can make a way through the wilderness and I can provide for you in the desert. I will meet your needs. I will bring you the answer to your deep thirst, the kind of thirst that the world can't satisfy. And that's what's so beautiful about the story of the woman of the well. Our Wednesday night group, I was there last. Incidentally, it's uh, for the next couple of weeks over at Pratt, uh, which is on the Jackson State side of town. And you know what's a very dangerous thing about life? Watch me. Being sure you know how to get where you think you're going. Because I didn't get there <laughs> the way I thought I knew. I got there eventually. And I think that's not bad either for the whole call to be a man or a woman of faith, that you think you know the way and sometimes it doesn't seem to work. Or you think you had the answer and it didn't seem to be the one, but you keep on seeking, you keep on finding until finally you do get the place, at least toward the place where you want to be. And I was only about 10 or 15 minutes late uh, to be able to walk into that. There's a passage of scripture that I just love. Um, in, it's Isaiah 55. It says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we did a workbook some years ago, and I don't want anybody to do this if you don't want to. I hate manipulative preachers. I promise you, I hate it. I hate it. But if anybody wants to do this, I'd like for you to just say that with me. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's try it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, if you'll do it the second time, I want you to hit the word taste. Emphasize taste. Let's go. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, the word see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay, and let's hit good, okay? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, you know. And that is a stream in the desert of your need. Uh, it's just one of the things. It says, come without money, come without price. It says, just simply come. And if you'll come, then I will be there with you. And I think that is extremely important to us. Uh, this way in the wilderness, this way that, uh, this thing that's beginning to spring forth and to come to us, as it had not come to us before. And so we spent that night in our house at home, and the next morning came to breakfast. And we came to breakfast. Those little buds in that little vase were glorious daffodils, two daffodils, closed buds the night before, open, full of life, full of color, full of hope, really. What they said to us was, when your question is, is there any hope beyond the moment? Is there any life on the other side of the cross? Is there anything real about all this church talk about resurrection? Is any of it real? The answer of two yellow daffodils is yes, indeed. For now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, yeah, God, you can't take a couple of flowers and make it a faith experience. But, oh, yes, God, you can take a couple of flowers and make it a faith experience. So if we think all there is is the cross and that there is no green coming toward blossom, help us, lift us up, stand us up, and then... In the spirit of Jesus, send us out. Amen.